Thank you for questions. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and uh, if anyone has questions, I'm open to questions. Um, Keep going, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So look, I'm going to talk about those three bottom projects. So the kids from Pumped Hydro, Desailey and Upper Burdekin. When the ABC took an interest in this story, um, I went through all the EPBC referrals and I came up with um, 12,900 hectares of vegetation to be cleared, classified remnant, and around 13,000 or so of non-remnant vegetation to be cleared. That's for the entire state of Queensland. However, most of the projects that are proposed are for North Queensland. So the majority of the, majority of the clearing is in North Queensland. Um, and ABC didn't believe me because I'm not an ecologist, I'm not a GIS specialist, I'm not a mapper. So I embarked and got a professional GIS person to do the mapping and they came up with 13,100 hectares, which I thought was remarkable. So I did all the maths, maths going through the EPBC referrals and then I had a totally independent person do another calculation and we both came at the same around the same value of 13,000 hectares of classified remnant vegetation to be cleared. Uh, so, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll just talk about the kids and pumped hydro. And we all talk about the kids and pumped hydro as being great. And it is, it is great um, in this, on the surface. So what it is, it's being, it's dis, it's utilizing a disused coal mine and filling in the two pits and putting it in a pumped, facility using solar panels and they've this is an aerial photo of what it is today and all the solar panels are over the quarry pit so it's a great utilization of dead land land that's been cleared quarried destroyed so the quarry pits are being used the old dams are being used and it's a great system and we need pumped hydro for the rollout of renewables, because we need to have that flexibility of having power on demand with pumped hydro and hydro. But when I dug a little bit deeper, I found that really for it to be viable, there needs to be um, 1,900 hectares of Fermita forest to be cleared. And that isn't evidence. And you've got to dig right down into the paperwork to find that. So, there is, there is a drawback with Kidston as well. So there is a big, vast amount of land that needs to be cleared to make it even more viable for the proponents. Um, so, so even when proponents say, oh, look, this is a great project, you really got to dig down deeper to find, it, to find more information. Um, and this is a typical fo a photo of the Fermita forest that needs to be cleared for the, for the 1,900 hectares of solar panels. Um, now the Desailly Energy Park, this is amazing. So what I spoke about before about what happened here is I live in Mariba Shire Council and I was going through the Mariba Shire minutes, the council minutes, because I was involved with the Kerwold campaign and I was looking for Kerwold issues in, in the minutes. And there was an item that came up called the Desailly Energy Park and I clicked on it and I thought, what's this all about? And it was 200 pages of information about this big solar farm near Mount Carbine. And I went through it. I read the entire 200 pages and it didn't say anywhere how big the footprint was. There was lots of maps and diagrams. So what I had to do was then go into Google Earth and draw a polygon to determine how much land was to be cleared for this energy park. And I worked out it was 2,400 hectares of Savannah woodlands to be cleared. Anyway, what happened with this project was the CEO under delegated authority, Peter Franks, signed it off and it went straight through council with not even the councillors seeing it. <laughs> it, so it and so what I'm saying is that these projects go through as code accessible. So there isn't any ability for the community to be involved. So hypothetically, we could have a huge solar farm, you know, in Myola, for example, and the local community really doesn't have any say. Um, yeah, so this is the footprint of the Desailly solar farm. It's hard up against the edge of Brooklyn Nature Refuge. And the reason why it rang alarm bells with me is because I take the kids camping on the McLeod River, and this is where, where the solar farm's going. I'm not against solar farms, we need solar farms. 
but can we put solar farms in areas that have already been degraded or cleared? And we've got the mapping available that show us that. But, but what, ha what happens here is that the proponents, um, they just want the cheapest land. And I'll talk about this later, but they want land that's hard up on the transmission line. So this, this is land that's hard up on the transmission line that goes up to Cooktown. Um, and it's also land that's been freeholded. So with land that's been freeholded, they don't have to deal with native title. <laughs> So that's another a loophole. So what they're looking for is land that's freeholded, don't have to deal with native title, it's on the transmission line, and this ticks all the boxes. And it's one owner, and they don't have to deal with multiple ownership of multiple tenures. Um, that's a layout of the solar panels across the site. The blue line through the middle is the, uh, uh, is the highway, whatever it's called. It's not the Kennedy Highway. Um, the highway going up to Cooktown, which also has the transmission line easement running along it. Um, and this is typical forest of what's there. So all that, so 1,000, what I calculated, 2,400 hectares of that sort of forest will need to be cleared for solar panels. And then when I dug a bit deeper, I, I actually, so what happened, I was doing a submission for the Shalumban wind farm. And I went onto the EPBC web portal to write a submission. And there was a, uh, an EPBC referral called Upper Burdekin Wind Farm. So I clicked on that and I thought, you've got to be joking. This is even bigger than Shalumban. <laughs> and no one knows about it. And it's a monster. And it's hard up on the wet tropics ward heritage area. So I, I downloaded all the, the documents, the EPBC referrals. I phoned up wet tropics and phoned up a few mates and decided to go down there and spend a week down there and try to ground truth it as well, the same as what I did at Shalumban. And basically this is a shot taken from the top of the Mount Fox crater looking southwest, everything there carved up into roads. Um, this is our 145 turbines. And again, this is a Fortescue Metals project um, by Twiggy Forest. Um, this is, um, I camped there overnight and got the drone up to show you a perspective of the Mount Fox crater. Everything you see there will be turbines, be everything beyond the, the crater. So the crater is actually an island national park surrounded by, by um, the subject property to be um, where the wind turbines are going. And uh, yeah, so everything there is turbines, roads. Um, and there's actually two here. There's the Mount Fox Energy Park and the Upper Burdekin wind farm side by side. So the cumulative impacts are just epic, over 200 turbines when you combine the two of them, um, well over 200 kilometers of new internal haulage roads. It's just massive. Um, everything you see looking up the screen to the top of the screen, all that country carved up into roads and turbines. On the right of this image is the wet tropics ward heritage area. So we spent a week down there, or not a week, about four nights, five days, and it was just epic. We found koalas there. I know um, a fellow called, um, uh, uh, there was a presentation done last week just at the tree, tree and mammal, uh, the mammal and tree kangaroo group at Melanda last week, talking about uh, koalas in North Queensland. And that upper Burdekin site is one of the strongholds for koalas in North Queensland. And it was just bizarre seeing koalas in North Queensland. Um, we saw shaman rock wallabies. There's a really good significant population of shaman rock wallabies there. Again, these rock wallabies were only discovered in 1974. <laughs> um, and the rock wallabies are found near all the boulder fields on the rocky ridge lines, the escarpments, and that's where the roads need to go. We found rufous bedongs, lots of wedge tail eagles. Um, we didn't see any red goshawks or masked owls, but they are on the site. The ecologists have found them. Um, we found Aboriginal rock art on the site. Um, it's a vast site. So I'm sure there's a lot of rock art through the ridges and the gorges. There's two gorge systems on the site. And there was hoop pines in the gorges, which show that there was absence of fire within those gorges for, for a long, long time. So quite significant vegetation types in the gorges. 
that's a footprint of this of the upper Burdekin wind farm. That little green triangle there, the little green island, that's the Mount Fox crater that I took the photo, photo from in those previous slides. And as you can see, there's turbines going all the way around. Um, that diagram in the bottom right is the Mount Emerald footprint to scale. So that sort of shows you the scale of Mount Emerald compared to the upper Burdekin site. Um, again, that red, the red lines are the footprint of the wind farm. And what you can see here is the Mount Fox polygon, the yellow polygon, that, that's Mount Fox Energy Park. <clears throat> like I said earlier, that's sitting with Susan Lay. We don't know what the footprint of that wind farm is. Um, it's somewhere within that polygon, and that is the most beautiful forest. Um, like I said, verging on wet scleriful rose gum forest. And look, they could be putting in 25, 30 turbines in there. Rumour is that it's, it's the proponents, that, uh, I don't know if this is true, but it's Mount Isa Mines, and they're financing that wind farm um, so they can make Mount Isa Mines carbon neutral. So they'll buy the energy coming out of that farm to make Mount Isa, so Mount, Mount Isa Mines will become carbon neutral and a green mine. <laughs> So I don't know if that's true, but that's what the locals are telling me um, that live there. And you know, there's quite a few locals there that are just horrified that they're, they're not being, there's no communication with the proponents. There's not big, uh, there's no meetings. They really, they're being kept left, left in the dark about this. Um, Steve, back up, sorry to interrupt, just so you know, um, I was on the Sarah website um, yesterday. I yes. believe that the Mount Fox Energy Park has got 57 turbines earmarked for it. Wow, well, that's news to me, so I'll write that down. That's amazing. Because that's a, that's a huge, that's a vast, well, that's the same as our Mount, so Mount Emerald's 55 turbines. You know, I hadn't actually, sorry, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I hadn't, I hadn't oh. actually heard of the Upper Burdekin one. I know about the Mount James one. I don't know if you're aware of that one. No, I've got no that's, idea of that, no. Well, that's, that's a good bit further south. It's about, about 80 kilometers north of Huendon, but they've got um, 200 turbines planned for that one. 200. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, I don't know, I would have to guess that um, this one in the upper Burdekin would have to be on a similar sort of scale. I, I, do you know the number of turbines for the upper Burdekin? Yeah, 100, 146. Right. Okay. Yeah, but when you but when you add that with the Mount Fox Energy Park, and you're saying there's 57, so you're looking at over 200 turbines there. Yeah. 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 So 200. Yeah. Okay. I won't interrupt you again. Just now. I know that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the footprint of those two uh, wind farms. Um, so just also too with again in terms of scale and. With the upper Burdekin wind farm, they're going to be monsters. So those blades are going to be 100 metres long, twice the size of Mount Emerald. Now, the visual amenity maps that I've looked at, and I can send you these if you like later, um, Colin, um, you'll be able to see the tops of those turbines from standing on the beach at Lucinda. That's how big they are from the coast. I know wet tropics are really concerned about seeing these turbines from the Wallaman Falls viewing platform lookout, because at the moment, they're going to be in the line of sight. So as you're standing on the Wallaman Falls viewing platform, I don't know if you've been there looking at the big waterfall, the biggest waterfall in Australia, you'll actually see the tops of the turbines in the distance. Um, so that whole visual amenity, which is, um, is, is, is of concern to the Wet Tropics Management Authority as well because Wallaman Falls was one of the criteria of the listing of the wet tropics, you know, the visual amenity of that, the biggest single waterfall drop in Australia or the Southern Hemisphere. And then, then you can have wind turbines in that field of view. And I've got nothing against visual amenity, you know, we need, we, we need wind turbines. What I'm saying is there's vast amounts of land mass where these projects are suitable. Um, I don't think putting them hard up on the wet tropics boundary is the right place. Um, now, what I also did here is I, to, to give a sense of scale, I overlaid the Upper Burdekin wind farm footprint over the city of Cairns. So you can sort of see the scale there. So that wind farm alone, if it was stretched over Cairns, it would extend from Palm Cove down to Yarrabah. 
Yeah, so it's it's a massive project. This is a $2 billion project, so $2 billion. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, I did my own topo overlays because the proponents won't do it. They don't want us to see where the turbines are going. So when you do the overlay, you can see that the turbines are going on the ridge lines, the hilltops, and that's where the Shaman rock wallabies are. There, that's where all the boulder fields are, the granite boulder fields, and that's where the, the, the rock wallabies want to hang out, and that's where they, that's where they exist. Um, uh, and as you can see, the straight line through the middle of that complex, there the transmission lines. So as you saw with the first photo of Mount Emerald, you've got all the turbines, but then all those turbines need to be connected with overhead transmission lines. So, it, and so those transmission line easements need to be cleared as well. Um, yeah, so that's a typical photo. This is straight out of the proponents ecological survey. So as you can see, the boulder fields, and then you've got the Charmin rock wallabies that live in these boulder fields. Um, the species list for Upper Burdekin just blows my brain. 130 bird species, uh, the red or goshawk masked owl. There's 25 microbat species, 16 terrestrial mammals, six uh, arboreal mammals, um, and the koala greater glider. And this that survey is just an incidental survey. Um, it's not they're doing a PR, a proper survey now, and no doubt they'll actually find more species there when they do a proper survey. Um, so what I also did was do an overlay of the footprint showing the extent of the Shaman rock wallaby habitat. So the light green area is the, the extent of the Shaman rock wallaby area. And the dark green is the Mount Zero Taro Vale um, nature refuge, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. So they are protected for perpetuity in that, in that um, dark green area, which is the, the uh, nature refuge, but all the other area outside of that area, they're unprotected. Uh, yeah, so, so by putting in those turbines could have a significant impact on those shaman rock wallaby populations, in particular the koalas. Um, so what I also did with that project is then because I had people within national parks saying, well, that upper Burdekin site was actually earmarked for national park for national park acquisition. It's such a special area in terms of high biodiversity. So what I did, I did some overlays. And as you can see, Waruna was purchased by national parks in 2010. Oak Hills was purchased in 2016. And the upper Burdekin site was earmarked for acquisition. <laughs> Um, but it's not going to happen now because Twiggy Forest has offered the landowner so much money that for national parks to cough up enough money to buy it, it's just not going to happen. So it was a lost opportunity. And I just wish national parks would have acquired the site, you know, 10 years ago before it was proposed as a wind farm. Because now we've got a place that is that has national park qualities that's going to be carved up potentially. <clears throat> yeah, so then I started to think, well, why, why is this happening in such a confined area? You know, like all these wind farms are happening on our doorstep. Why is, why is this happening? And I, I quickly learned that it's all about the transmission lines. So what I did, I produced a map that shows all the transmission lines in North Queensland. And as you can see, there's two red lines running up. One runs up the coast and one runs a bit inland. And it's that inland one that developers, wind farms and solar farms want to get onto. They want to hug that transmission line because for every kilometre they build a project off that transmission line can cost millions and millions of dollars per kilometre because they've got to deal with tenure issues, uh, geography, geology, and they need to run, because they need to tra run transmission lines to connect those renewable projects to the high voltage transmission line running down the east coast of Australia. So to save their money, they want to be on that transmission line. And it doesn't matter what the vegetation is like. It doesn't matter <laughs> because it gets approved as code accessible. It goes to the state, to the state code 23. It gets assessed, excluding Department of Environment and Science. It gets um, rubber stamped quite easily um, because the state code is not strict 
and has no enforcement. I know it goes through, through Sarah, but Sarah failed Caban. Um, and, then it, and then it goes through to the federal government and it's the only mechanism in place is the EPBC Act to stop some inappropriate developments. And we all know that the EPBC Act is not worth the, the paper that it's written on. So that's how they're going through the system. And for the developers, they're just going for the easy, for the low hanging fruit. And the low hanging fruit are the properties hard up on the transmission lines, preferably one big property so they don't have to deal with many landowners. And if it's freeholded and they don't have to deal with native title, even better. And uh, so what it is, it, that, that's really what it's all about. And it, it just happens that there is a big wind resource on the Atherton Tablelands. However, when you look at the wind resource mapping, there is a big wind resource west of Cairns. It's even bigger west of Cairns, about 100 kilometres, 50 to 100 kilometres west of Cairns. There's a massive wind resource. <clears throat> so what we want to see is, is um, perhaps transmission lines, spur lines going further to the west into the lower biodiverse areas where these projects can flourish. Now, if we look at the next slide, can you see that red blob appear? That's Mount Emerald, which is hard up on the transmission line. If I show the next slide, we can see the Caban project. Again, it's on the transmission line. If I show the next slide, oh, we've got the Desailly project up north, which is actually on the transmission line going up to Cooktown. If I show the next slide, we've got the Shalumban project again, hard up on the transmission line. And if I show the next slide, we see the Upper Burdekin project. So, so what we're seeing here is a, <coughs> what we're seeing is a, um, uh, um, yeah, we're seeing a pattern occurring where all the wind farms are occurring on the transmission line between Cairns and, Br and Brisbane. And if we look at some of the big wind farms down south, like uh, Clark Creek and a few others, again, they're on the ridge lines, on the hilltops, where they happen to be on the transmission lines. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so that's, that's why it's happening. That's why it's happening. That's all it is. And it doesn't matter, like I said, it doesn't matter what the vegetation is like, because they've got an easy ride through the three tiers of government to get these projects up and running. What I've also done here is overlaid the ANU pumped hydro. So the Australian National University also did some mapping on where um, suitable sites would be for pumped hydro. And that shows you where there's potential locations for pumped hydro in the future. And as you can see, some of those pumped hydro sites are within protected areas, but there's some areas that are outside protected areas in low biodiversity areas. So we as conservationists need to be aware of that and also um, try to push government policy into pushing some of these projects into areas of low biodiversity. Um, I'll just go back to that slide. So what I, what, what I want to see is um, a process. I want to see planning going forward for the rollout of renewables that push renewables into low biodiverse areas further to the west. Um, what I want to see is mapping done by the state government, preferably by conservation groups going forward, to give to state government departments to say, well, these are places of high biodiversity. These are state listed corridors, high value corridors for wildlife. So these are the high wind resource areas. These are the high solar areas. Um, have a map that overlays all these areas and then go, okay, well, this big hunk to the state that are available for the rollout of renewables. And this is the priority. These are the prior, priority areas. Government policy should be directing renewables into those areas of the state. And <clears throat> that, that's what should be happening. But the state government is just is doing nothing. It's got it sitting on its hands and it's letting gov, um, private developers come in and dictate policy on where they want renewables to go because it's cheap. But what we want to say is, no, well, that's a, we don't want you to put them there because it's cheap. We want you to put renewables here because that's the best area. That's a win-win for local communities, traditional owners and the environment. So, you know, 
And the transition to renewables should be a great process. You know, we've been fighting as conservationists for 20 years or longer for the, the rollout of renewables. And we want it to be a win-win. Um, we don't want it to follow the same pattern of coal and coal seam gas where big industry, because these are big industries, these are big multinational companies coming in and dictating to us where they want to go. We should be telling these industries where we want them to go. Um, so we want it to be a win-win and that's what we need to do as conservationists is try to, um, my belief is that we've won the climate action campaign. Yeah, so my thoughts are, you know, what cost do we continue? Should we, should we be clearing high value forests to decarbonize? I think it doesn't pass the pub test, what we're doing at the moment. Um, this is an industry conducting a really brutal assault on classified remnant forests. And it's not the fault of the renewable energy companies. They're just trying to get their maximum return for shareholders. Um, we need to be directing where these big industries go and the environment movement needs to transition quickly into that direction. So we've won the climate change wars. Renewable industries are moving very quickly. We need to now start directing policy on the best outcome in the rollout of this.